Here's what I want you to remember from my talk. Donations hurt. If you have donated medical equipment to a developing world hospital, you have probably hurt the recipients you were intending to help. Let me explain what I mean. I know exactly when I learned what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. I was in an operating room in Managua, Nicaragua. On the table was this beautiful little girl with big round brown eyes and a huge smile. Despite the fact that she had grown up in Managua poor and with a uh, congenital heart defect so she could barely walk or run without getting shortness of breath. And I was there with a team, a team of surgeons, intensivists, nurses, and one engineer. That was me, the one engineer. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't her condition. It wasn't the little girl. That wasn't the thing that stuck with me. So it was, it was, a, it was a critical moment in the surgery. Very quiet very quiet. None of the usual banter between the surgeon and the nurse, between the nurses. Very intense moment in surgery. Very quiet. And the overhead surgery lights caught on fire. There was smoke billowing out of the lights, those big surgery lights that you have, the shadowless surgery lights at the top of the ceiling. Smoke was billowing out of them. But actually that wasn't it either for me. So now you would think, you would think, I mean smoke is literally billowing out of the surgery lights. You would think, this is a big panic moment. This is the middle of surgery. In fact, the Americans were panicking pretty well. But not the Nicaraguans. The Nicaraguans in the room were not panicking. In fact, they, the nurses, pulled out of somewhere, a corner or something, I had gone unnoticed by me. They pulled out a blanket and immediately covered up the patient. They knew exactly what to do. In fact, it was clear from their reaction, it was clear to me, this was routine. This was routine in their surgery room. Can you imagine? Can you imagine fire in the operating room? Routine? But even that, even that was not the moment that I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So they called the tech. The tech came in, a technician who was on call came in. And again, not surprised, not shocked, not even panicking, or not even really all that interested, frankly. He starts pulling the light bulbs out of the smoldering fixture and replacing them with 100 watt light bulbs. And I'm talking about regular 100 watt light bulbs like you would buy at Walmart or just at the corner store. And I said, stop it! You can't do that. You can't put regular 100 watt light bulbs in that fixture. That fixture demands special light bulbs. They have this silvery heat reflector that reflects heat away from the fixture. If you put in regular 100 watt light bulbs, the, the fixture will overheat and well, it'll catch fire. And the technician, very calmly, not, no contempt, no surprise either, he said, I know that. I know that. What do you want me to do? The light bulbs aren't available in Nicaragua. And even if they were available in Nicaragua, we couldn't afford them. So our choices are do surgery with an occasional fire or do no surgery at all. What do you want me to do? Now I knew exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I founded Engineering World Health, EWH, together with Dr. Mohamed Kiani, who is now the chair of mechanical engineering at Temple University, and Kathy Peck. We founded Engineering World Health to try to solve that problem in the hospital in Nicaragua. But of course, it's not just that hospital. This is a worldwide problem. The director general of the uh, World Health Organization recently said at a talk that she gave in Bangkok last fall, about 70%, as you just heard in the screech, about 70% of important medical equipment in the developing world does not function, and only 10 to 30% of donated equipment ever becomes operational. In fact, she was citing some early work that we did when we were asked in my lab at Duke, we were asked to help rewrite, rewrite the WHO donation guidelines, medical equipment donation guidelines. Actually, we just, coincidentally, just today, published the full study, about 112,000 pieces of medical equipment we tracked in 16 poor countries. This problem is worldwide. The problem is everywhere. And in fact, for that reason, at least partially for that reason, EWH, or Engineering World Health, has grown tremendously since its inception. We, in fact, are the world's largest provider of post-donation medical equipment service to resource poor settings. But you know, it has not always been like this. It has not always been like that. In fact, when we started EWH, our original vision was to take medical equipment out of American hospitals. At that time, American hospitals like the one on my campus at Duke and like the one here at Chapel Hill, 
they were retiring hundreds of, I mean tons, I mean literally tons of medical equipment was being, was being retired out of these hospitals in fleets. So our idea was we'll pick up you know, some of that equipment, just a small fraction, we'll refurbish it, clean it up, and ship it off to the developing world. And in fact, that is exactly what we did. We shipped containers of equipment to Asia, Africa, Central America, all over the world. And then a funny thing happened. I was on a trip to Nicaragua again, and it was about six months, maybe a little longer, after a container that we had shipped had been delivered to a hospital. I was visiting the hospital. I wanted to see all the good that our donated equipment was doing. So I went around the hospital, and I couldn't find the equipment. It wasn't in the ER. It wasn't in the OR. It wasn't in the ICU. It wasn't in Clin Lab. I found a piece or two, but most of the equipment was missing. So uh, I went to a friend, a colleague, a doctor at the hospital. I said, hey, where's all this equipment that we donated? Then I saw something I never thought I was going to see. He took me across town to a building, very nondescript building. Went inside the building, and I saw piles. Pile, no, not piles, a sea of donated medical equipment. A room much, much larger than this room, just filled from floor to ceiling, from front to back with donated medical equipment. In fact, this hospital had received so much donated equipment, including, sadly, the equipment that EWH had donated, that they had to rent this enormous building <laughs> just to house all the donated equipment. In fact, it probably would have been cheaper for them to purchase the few pieces of donated equipment they actually used rather than rent this facility. In essence, in essence, our donation had hurt this hospital. We had sent this hospital backwards. Now, uh, I wish I could say that was the only case. Unfortunately, it is not. Uh, between um, 2003 and 2006, we surveyed 54 hospital directors and administrators in 16 developing world countries. And now you know the answer, what their major complaint was. It was in the screech test. Their major complaint, their number one complaint, they had too much equipment. Not that they had too little equipment. Their major complaint was that they had too much equipment. Now, now just to be clear here, I'm not trying to say that they had the right equipment. In fact, much of the equipment they couldn't use, exactly as the director general says, 30, 20, 10, 30 percent of the donated equipment never works. But they had too much equipment. The root of the problem here, the root of the problem is donations don't work. Donations don't work. Now let's just take a step back here and just think about this for a second. Director general said 70 percent of the medical equipment doesn't work. Let's just say, just for discussion purposes, let's say it's 50 percent doesn't work. How would that work in your life? Let's say in your, your kitchen. You go into your kitchen, the toaster works, but the oven doesn't turn on. The stove works, but the refrigerator doesn't cool. You can get hot water sometimes, but not cold. Could you cook? Do you think a doctor can practice medicine under those conditions? Of course not. But actually, Actually, there's another, there's another number here that bothers me out of this paper that we just published. As I said, there's 112,000 pieces that we tracked in that paper. About 5% of that equipment, about 5% of the equipment was locally produced. Mostly wheelchairs, mobility devices, wheelchairs, crutches and things, and lighting devices, overhead lights, surgery lights, exam lights, and things like that. At first, that doesn't sound even potentially all that Shocking, these are very poor countries. These are very relatively simple pieces of medical equipment. But this is really an insidious fact. Because those two categories, mobility devices and lighting devices, those are two of the most commonly donated pieces of medical equipment. So in fact, if you're donating medical equipment, you are probably putting somebody out of a job in the developing world. And by the way, I am not just talking about uh, donated medical equipment used. This is also new medical equipment. We just completed a survey of eight African medical device manufacturers. And you know what they complained about mostly is the competition from donated medical equipment. They can't compete with all the donated medical equipment. And it's not just donated medical equipment. It, it is also new, donated used medical equipment. It is also donated new medical equipment. 
In fact, the chief category of donated equipment that they were trying to compete with was donated new medical equipment. Donated medical equipment that was manufactured under contract, de facto, meaning manufactured in China. Um, just piles of this equipment. I just wanted to get you a sense. We found this equipment in Africa. We found this equipment in Asia. We found this equipment in Central America. We found this equipment everywhere. By the way, not only is it used donated equipment, not only is it new donated equipment, in fact, it's all aid. All aid hurts the recipient. If you want to get into this in more detail, there's an excellent book called Dead Aid by uh, Dambizi Moya. It's a great book on the destructive power of aid. OK, so, so maybe I've convinced you. Maybe I've convinced you. Donating doesn't work. It doesn't work, perhaps, because lots of the donated equipment doesn't work. Lots of it, even if it did work, the hospital couldn't use it because they couldn't get spare parts for it or replacement. And even if they could, there's always a risk that you're putting somebody out of business. Some local person is losing their job. The question is, what can we do about it? Well, first of all, let me tell you what we did about it. After I saw that um, warehouse in Nicaragua, EWH stopped donating equipment, or for the most part, stopped donating equipment. And yet, this has had an interesting twist to it because even though we've stopped donating, equipment. EWH is still one of the world's largest providers of working medical equipment to the developing world. And the reason is we fix so much of other people's donations. Uh, in a summer program called the Engineering World Health Summer Institute, which I run uh, through a subcontract at Duke University, we place 50 to 60 biomedical engineers and engineering students in developing world hospitals every summer. And they fix equipment. Also, I run a program called the Global Public Service Academies through an agreement with MIT, the Edgerton Center at MIT. So high school students can also get on the ground in healthcare settings and make a difference. And actually, it's not just that the students repair equipment. They also come up with solutions, solutions for problems that would never even have occurred in the US. For example, our students in the Engineering World Health Summer Program have rewired surgery lights all over the world. They pull out the fixture and they rewire the fixture for a backup bulb of a truck, a backup light from a truck. They actually pull out the fixture and put in a new fixture. Now, when the light bulb burns out, they can find a replacement locally. It's a truck backup light. And, of course, by the way, the fixtures don't catch fire anymore. There's more, though, that EWH does. In uh, 2010, I published a paper with one of my students analyzing 3,000 work orders, that is, repair records, uh, from poor hospitals in 11 countries, 60 hospitals. And what we discovered is there's only about 100 to 120 skills that you need to bring a lot of this donated equipment back into service in these hospitals. And these hospitals desperately need this equipment. And these are skills, by the way, that aren't typically taught. I'm talking about skills, for example, how do you replace a fuse when you can't find the replacement fuse in the marketplace? How do you repair a blood pressure cuff with a bicycle tire kit, repair kit? Now, we're the Engineering World Health, EWH, is now uh, delivering this training in countries all over the world, Africa, Central America, Southeast Asia. Data is a little preliminary, but we have some excellent data coming in from uh, Rwanda, for example. In a match study, and I believe it's the first match study ever conducted of medical technician training, uh, technicians who went through our training program had 35% less out-of-service equipment. So it's having a huge impact. But OK, that's what we can do. What can you do? What can you all do? Well, first of all, if you're donating medical equipment, new or used, stop it. Stop it. You're hurting people. Stop donating the equipment. OK, fine. But you know, you're probably not donating medical equipment. That's a relatively small fraction. But you may be donating to charities. There's about 140 charities in the US that donate medical equipment. And you may be donating to one of those charities. If you are, please ask this one question of the executive director of the operation that you're donating to. How much of your medical equipment is treating patients six months after the donation? Now, first of all, they had better be doing better than what the director general said, 70% not functioning. They should definitely be doing better than that. But by the way, by the way, 
in the hundreds of thousands of pieces of medical equipment. We've tracked in hundreds of hospitals all over the world, probably thousands of hospitals. We have never, ever seen a donation of new or used equipment that has been 100% functional. So if your executive director says, everything we donate is working six months after we have delivered it, please donate to another charity. They have no idea what they're doing. All right, last thought before I finish up here. How about people are doing new equipment? A lot of what we've already heard a little bit of and what we'll hear some more of is developing new equipment. And in my lab, we develop new equipment at Duke as well. We have products for the prevention of transmission of HIV from mother to child, products for dealing with cervical cancer. What can we do, those who are developing new equipment? Well, some stuff is obvious. First of all, make sure you're designing the equipment so that the spare parts are locally available, so that consumables like light bulbs are locally available, et cetera. But we can do better than that. I want to add one more piece to this. Develop it also for local production, or at least partial local production. In other words, don't develop the new piece of equipment for lowest cost. In fact, by the way, in that survey, of 54 hospital directors, capital expenditure, that is the one-time expenditure to purchase a piece of equipment, that was not one of the things they complained about. So just making our new medical whiz-banger for the developing world cheap, that's actually not solving one of the problems. But if you make it locally produced, even partially local produced, and I do understand that that's gonna make it a little bit more expensive, probably. First of all, first of all, you may be employing somebody you may be giving a job to somebody. I mean, that's the essence of development, isn't it? To give somebody a job. And second of all, when that piece breaks, and it will break, at least that aspect of it can be fixed locally. Now, there we go. Remember that little girl I started out with? She was on the table during surgery. Actually, this is not her, actually. This is just a really, really cute girl that really wanted me to take her picture. But that girl did fine. The surgery went fine. She's now grown up, actually, so is this girl has now grown up as well. And in fact, that little girl has no idea. She never knew and never will know about the excitement that happened during the surgery or, in fact, the life-changing experience I had during her surgery. Thank you very much. <laughs>